Good morning and happy Sabbath church. Uh, thank you for the leadership of this church for the opportunity to give uh, the message today. Again, we want to, we are, our thoughts are with uh, Pastor Mark and with Patricia, as well as with Pastor Roldan and Marina who are away at this time. Um, I also want to thank Joan for the kind introduction. Um, although I have a little concern that she set expectations maybe a little too high, but, but thank you for the kind words. Um, I've entitled my message today, Obstacles to Putting God First. Obstacles to Putting God First. So $923. So that's the average amount, the number that the respondents of one survey estimated that they will spend this holiday season, $923. Now, perhaps someone here or watching online might look at that number and say, you know, Brother Fabian, I don't have $923, period, much less to spend on gifts for someone else. Brother Fabian, I'm just trying to keep up with the rate of inflation and to keep food on my uh, table and a roof over my head. Brother Fabian, I wish I had the luxury of spending $923 on gifts for other people. Perhaps someone else here might look at that number and say, you know, Brother Fabian, there's still tonight after sunset, and there's still tomorrow for some last minute shopping. And Brother Fabian, I am well past that number. Brother Fabian, you don't know my friends, you don't know my family members. They like the finer things in life. I cannot go to the regular department stores to shop for those gifts. I need to go to the higher end department stores. Brother Fabian, I wish one year I could spend that amount and not the exorbitant amounts that I have to spend every year. Well, that's the nature of averages, right? Some will be below, some will be above, some might be directly on that average, and they might have outliers on either, either side. But then I started to wonder, given that amount that individuals will be spending after they start uh, swiping their credit cards, after they start tapping their credit cards or tapping their mobile devices to make those purchases. And as the tally goes from $50 to $150 to 215 to 333 to 420 to 580, 650, all the way up to 923, started to wonder at what point do most people in this process think about God? Are they thinking about God when they are trying to remember you know, the subtle or maybe not so subtle hints that their loved ones might have left in terms of gifts that they want? Do they think about God at that point? Do they think about God when the loved ones receive the exact gift that they're looking for and they see the joy on their faces? Or is it perhaps that maybe it's just become a routine or tradition during this time of year. This is something we just do. We just exchange gifts and perhaps God might not be in the picture. And then I started to wonder more generally if it is possible potentially that we might lose focus on God during the Christmas season. Then I started to wonder in general during our spiritual Christian walk, what are some things that perhaps might cause us to lose focus that take our eyes off of him? As the scripture reading says, the Bible says that we need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So what are some potential things that might be obstacles for us in keeping us on our way? Um, there could be a lot of answers to that question, but today I want to look at uh, three areas that are obstacles to putting God first. I want to look at some uh, examples from the Bible and perhaps uh, some takeaway lessons that we can have today. Please bow your heads with me for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we come to you again. We thank you for bringing us to this 23rd uh, day of December, the second to last Sabbath in the year 2023. We thank you for bringing us thus far. We ask now, I ask now that as I open the message and bring the word, that the words that I say will be your words and that we will apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the first obstacle I want to look at today is the love of money. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, that the love of money is a root of all evil. 
which while some covered it after, they have erred from the faith and perished them through with many sorrows. Notice that the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. There's nothing wrong inherently with money. Indeed, money can do a lot of good in the hands of trustworthy Christians. You can help a lot of people with money. However, the problem becomes when the pursuit of money, the love of money becomes an end goal of itself to the degree that we take our eyes off of Jesus. There are many examples of this in the Bible. Perhaps one of the most salient and unfortunate examples in the Bible is that of Judas. Judas was entrusted to be one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, the same Jesus that we are celebrating this Christmas season. And with that trust, he had a lot of privileges. He had the ability to see Jesus worked miracles firsthand. He had the ability to hear Jesus directly, um, teaching not only the crowds, but the apostles individually. He had the ability to see Jesus show love and concern and interest in all of the individuals that he came in contact with. Nevertheless, with all of those privileges, he still, um, it was not enough to melt his heart from this thing called the love of money, and he decided to betray Jesus. I mean, every, all of us here, given those opportunities, given those privileges, would never think of doing something as bad as betraying Jesus. But yet, this is the cautionary tale about the love of money. We get to see uh, some of um, the mindset of Judas, uh, starting with John chapter 12. The context here is that Mary, knowing that Jesus was about to die, she wanted to do something that would honor him and also to show her gratitude, her love, her devotion for the sacrifice that Jesus was about to make, not only for her, but for all of mankind. So he, she brought a, bought a costly box of ointment and anointed him and prepared him for his burial. This is what Judas said when he saw the love expressed from Mary. Um, going from John chapter 12, verse four through six, reading from John chapter 12. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but that he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Now, the 300 pence of ointment, uh, the, the ointment cost, uh, commentators believe that this equated to roughly about the amount of money that the average worker back then would receive for 300 working days. So indeed, it was a very generous gift, a very costly gift. But Judas, on seeing this, he pretended that there could have been a more noble purpose for that, uh, the money, knowing full well that if that money had come into his possession, the poor would have not seen any of it. He was a treasurer, and he had the bag, and he wanted that money for himself. <clears throat> and the thing is, when Jesus defended Mary, and essentially said, you know, you have the poor with you every day. You can do, you can do good to them whenever you want. Um, he felt rebuked and decided, and that's one of the reasons why he decided to betray Jesus. Let's see what the book Desire of Ages has to say about this. I'm reading from the book uh, Desire of Ages, page 564. It said, Judas had indulged avarice until it empowered every good trait of his character. He grudged the offering made to Jesus. His heart burned with envy that the Savior should be the recipient of a gift suitable for the monarchs of the earth. For a sum far less than the box of ointment cost, he betrayed his Lord. So the 30 pieces of silver that Judas betrayed Jesus for, commentators estimate that to be roughly the amount of money that the average worker back then would get for 120 days um, of work. So Judas was complaining about the box of ointment that Mary gave, where for a sum less than half of that, um, he betrayed the creator of the universe, his Lord and his Savior. In addition to those, uh, the privileges that I mentioned before, Judas even had additional advantages, right? As being one of the apostles, he was given the authority and had the ability to perform miracles just like Jesus. 
He had the ability to cast out demons. He had the ability to serve as an evangelist as well. Um, let's continue uh, reading with the Desire of Ages. He loved the great teacher, speaking of Judas, and desired to be with him. He felt a desire to be changed in character and life, and he hoped to experience this through connecting himself with Jesus. The Savior did not repulse Judas. He gave him a place among the twelve. He trusted him to do the work of an evangelist. He endowed him with power to heal the sick and to cast out devils. But Judas did not come to the point of surrendering himself fully to Christ. He did not give up his worldly ambition or his love of money. Today I'm talking about obstacles to putting God first, and the first obstacle is the love of money. This seems to be what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 7 when he says, you know, speaking of the end times, many would come in that day saying, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have done many wonderful, wondrous works, and in your name has cast out demons. And Jesus said that he would say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And I used to wonder, how can someone cast out demons in the name of Jesus, and the demons actually le le uh, left the person, and then but they're not being connected with Jesus. But it seems as if it would appear that Judas is a prime example of that. It seems that he is exhibit A. Not only um, did he have those abilities, as I mentioned before, he also served as an evangelist. It might very well be the case that some of the individuals that Judas preached to might have surrendered to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit might have worked on their hearts and they have accepted the gospel call. However, Judas himself did not do that. That seems to be connected to with uh, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where he says, what I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So it seems that Judas fell into the same trap or uh, bad outcome that Paul was warning against. Again, this is a power and a cautionary tale of the love of money, and we should take heed to that. Let's look at another example, um, perhaps a little less familiar to some of us. That is with Bezalel and Aholiab. Now we know that, uh, most of us know in the Old Testament, God commissioned Moses to build a sanctuary. He said, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Not only did God commission Moses to build a sanctuary, he also showed him a pattern of the sanctuary that should be built. He showed him that in a mount. Not only did God show him the pattern of the, mount, uh, the, the tabernacle that should be built, he also gave him specific, precise instructions for how to build a sanctuary, how many compartments there should be, how many curtains there should be, what color the curtains should be, how many uh, items of furniture should be in which compartment, what are the dimensions of those furnishings, um, what material those furnishings should be made out of. Very precise, meticulous details. Not only did God give precise uh, details for how to build a sanctuary, he said in Exodus chapter 35, I have called by name Bezalel and, Bezalel and Aholiab and given them directly the skills needed for the construction of this sanctuary. So what are some of those skills? They were, had the ability to embroider. They had the ability to engrave. They had the ability to cut stones. They had the ability to carve different works. Anything that's necessary to build a sanctuary, God says, I've directly given these two individuals the ability to do that. And everything was done according as God commanded. The sanctuary was built and the congregation brought the materials and everything was done all to plan and that was awesome. And we, today we have an excellent representation of the plan of salvation through the sanctuary service. The problem came though with the descendants of Bezalel and Aholiab. So just through genetics, they inherited to some degree some of the skills that these individuals have. And some of them noticed that, you know what? Whenever I 
make a new woodworking project, whenever I carve some stones, whenever I do, you know, fashion something for the church or even for myself, I get a lot of compliments on it. I see other individuals trying to do the same thing, and they give a lot of effort. I see them, I see the effort they try, and they take, you know, twice or maybe three times as long to do the same thing, and the outcome doesn't come nearer what I can do with the skill that I can provide. Um, and some of them went a little further, that was just me paraphrasing, but um, some of them went a little further, unfortunately, unfortunately, and said, you know what? I think I can make a lot of money making, do, using these skills for foreign kings. So again, I'm talking about love of money being one of the obstacles to putting God first. Let's see what the book Prophets and Kings says about this. The descendants of these workmen inherited to a large degree the talents conferred on their forefathers. For a time, these men of Judah and Dan remain humble and unselfish. Bezalel was from the tribe of Judah. Aholiab was from the tribe of Dan. But gradually, almost imperceptibly, they lost their hold upon God and their desire to serve him unselfishly. They asked higher wages for their services because of their superior skill as workmen in the finer arts. In some instances, their request was granted, but more often they found employment in the surrounding nations. In place of the noble spirit of self-sacrifice, they had filled the hearts of their illustrious ancestors. That had filled the hearts of their illustrious ancestors. They indulged a spirit of covetousness, of grasping for more and more. That their selfish desires might be gratified, they used their God-given skill in the service of heathen kings and lent their talent to the perfecting of works which were a dishonor to their maker. So they, desired, they decided to use their God-given skill. The skill was not that it was not even given to them directly. It was given to their forefathers. They just happened to inherit some of that skill because they were in the same lineage. The lineage. But that skill that God gave them, they decided to use that to make works that were a dishonor to their maker. When the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil, this is a prime example. They're using it for works that dishonor the same maker that gave them that skill. Perhaps somebody um, might know um, of an individual that grew up in the church. Maybe had, they displayed some talent. Maybe they were able to sing. Maybe they were able to play an instrument. Maybe they were very good on the audiovisual equipment. They can make anyone sound like an angel on these microphones. But perhaps they might have thought that you know what, I can make a lot of money using this skill for the world instead of for God. And they might have left the church. Um, some of them, fortunately, later on might be able to come back, but unfortunately some of them got lost to the world and stayed out there. Um, it seems that they have fallen to, temptation, fallen to the temptation that Jesus succeeded in when the devil took him up to the high mountain and said, all of these things, I will give you all the pleasures of this world, the, 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 this world I will give you if you bow down to me. But Jesus responded and said, um, get thee behind me, Satan, worship the Lord thy God only. So in other words, to put God first. So this leads me to my first takeaway in the sermon. Don't make commercialism and the love of money distract from the real goal of the season, which is to put God first. And I know during this holiday season, we are eager to spend time with family. We are eager, perhaps, to give and receive gifts. But I encourage every one of us here today that we please, uh, to please spend some time reflecting on the gift that God gave in sending his son to die for us and to save us uh, from our sins. That's the first obstacle, I have two more to go. The second obstacle is pride, specifically pride as it relates and manifests itself in self-exaltation, in an extreme focus on oneself and arrogance. Now this is, you know, we can find this all the way back in the beginning from Lucifer. He 
demonstrated pride in heaven in wanting Jesus' position, but God had to kick him and the evil angels out of heaven. And they came here to this earth and unfortunately tried to instill the same character flaw in people all throughout Earth's history. We can find many examples of this in the Bible. One example is King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. So in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a metallic image. The head was of gold, represents him as the uh, king of Babylon. The next one was the breast and arms of silver, the belly and arms of thigh, sorry, belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay, signifying that after the uh, Babylonian kingdom, there would be multiple uh, successive kingdoms after that. But Nebuchadnezzar demonstrated pride in the form of self-exaltation and arrogance. He said, I know what God says, but here's what I'm going to do. In Daniel chapter 3, he reared up an image that was all of gold, signifying that he believes that Babylon would have been an indestructible uh, kingdom and that it will last forever, going completely contra contrary to what God said. And in fact, he said, anybody that doesn't bow down to this image, I'm going to throw into the um, fiery furnace, but God had to show who was in control, and he rescued the three Hebrew boys out of the fiery furnace, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged God at that time. However, that was not the end of it. In Daniel chapter 4, still in Babylon, <coughs> sorry, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar said, is this not Babylon that I have built by my wisdom and, by my, and for my honor? Again, demonstrating pride in the form of arrogance. And again, God had to show him who was in control. He was driven from the kingdom and served seven years, essentially acting as an animal, until he finally learned uh, to humble himself. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar confessed himself in Daniel chapter 4. He said, Daniel chapter 4, verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to obey. He was basically saying, in effect, that God's ways are just, God's ways are true, and that he is able to humble anyone that oversteps their bounds in pride. He was also confessing himself that essentially he was acting uh, in a proud manner in the past, but now that he was humbled, driven from the kingdom for seven years, then, then he was able to have a relationship with God. So again, that is just a cautionary tale and a warning for us to not have pride be an obstacle in putting God first. The second example I want to give is the religious leaders at Jesus' birth, and that's perhaps more directly related to this Christmas time that we're in right now. And we pretty much know the story. The angels gave the glad tidings of the birth of Jesus. And they gave, them, they gave the shepherds uh, a sign saying, you should find the babe, the babe of Jesus, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And the shepherds are very excited. They are very happy to hear this glorious news. In fact, they hastily obeyed what the angel said and went directly to Bethlehem and found exactly as the angel said. They found Mary, they found Joseph, and they found the baby Jesus in the manger. And they were so excited, they gave glory to God. They told everybody um, around that would listen to them the great news that the Savior is born. Now, this news, this report of the shepherds came to the religious leaders and what they did, they treated it with disdain and with contempt. They basically said, you know, we are not even going to listen to this. This is not worth our time. And then later, there are wise men from the East that were studying the prophecies, the prophecies that the religious leaders were also familiar with. They saw the star in the East, and they came to Jerusalem and asked a question. They said, where is he that is born the king of the Jews? I, we have seen his star, and we're come to worship him. You guys, can you help us out? He should be around here somewhere. Can you tell us where we can find him? Now, this 
put the religious leaders in a, a bind. They have a problem at this point. So let's see in the Desire of Ages what the problem was. Um, I'm looking at Desire of Ages, reading from Desire of Ages, page 62. Now pride and envy closed the door against the light. If the reports brought by the shepherds and the wise men were credited, they would place the priests and rabbis in a most unenviable position, disproving their claim to be the exponents of the truth of God. These learned teachers would not stoop to be instructed by those whom they termed heathen. I'm talking about pride as an obstacle to putting God first. It could not be, they said, could not be that God had passed them by to communicate with ignorant shepherds or uncircumcised Gentiles. They determined to show their contempt for the reports that were exciting King Herod and all Jerusalem. They would not even go to Bethlehem to see whether these things were so. And they led the people to regard the interest in Jesus as a fanatical excitement. Here began the rejection of Christ by the priests and rabbis. From this point, their pride and stubbornness grew into a settled hatred of the Savior. While God was opening the door to the Gentiles, the Jewish leaders were closing the door to themselves. So what does this demonstrate? This demonstrates pride in the form of self-exaltation and arrogance. They're basically saying there is no way that the God of the universe can pass us by and go to these quote-unquote heathen people, the shepherds and the wise men, to tell them about his birth. There's no way the God of the universe could pass us by as noble as we are, as dignified as we are, as regal as we are, as educated as we are, and give the message of the glad tidings um, to these individuals. So what they said, something must be wrong here because their pride was uh, rising up in them. And they said, some, because they think something is wrong, they rejected this news about the Savior that has come into the world to save our sins, all because of pride. Um, there's def that's definitely a warning for us. Um, okay. So now let's contrast this proud behavior with Jesus, the same Jesus that we're celebrating this Christmas season. Jesus, the book Desire of Ages said, if Jesus had come to this earth when humanity had not sinned, when Adam and Eve had not sinned, when humanity was still perfect and in pristine condition, it would have been an almost infinite humiliation for him to come at that time if humanity was perfect. But Jesus did not come at that point in time. He came after roughly 4,000 years of degradation of sin. He came after the, heart, the thoughts and intents of man's heart was only evil continually, so God had to destroy this world with a flood, and only Noah and his family were saved. He came after king after king after king in Israel and Judah, kept turning the people from the worship of the true God in heaven to the worship of Baal and other, um, other gods, even though God kept sending prophet after prophet after prophet to bring the hearts of the people back to serve the true God. He came after all of the evil plots, all of the evil machinations, all of the murderers, the lies, the thief, uh, deception, all of the things that we can read about in the Old Testament. After 4,000 years of that, that is when Jesus came into the world. So you can imagine if it would have been an almost infinite humiliation to him to come when humanity was perfect, how much worse it, would have, it was for him to come at that point in time. And it goes further. Jesus not only came after uh, the world was degraded, he also humbled himself to the death of a cross. Uh, one of the worst ways for anyone to die in any time period. Uh, he humbled himself to say, not my will, Lord uh, God, but thy will be done. He's essentially saying, you know what? I know, God, that we had this plan of salvation before the foundation of the world, and I'm here to fulfill this plan, but if there's any way we can fill that plan by me not going through this, let's, do, let's choose that option, but not my will, but thy will be done. So he humbled himself 
to the death of the cross. The Bible says that humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Jesus humbled himself even to the death of a cross and God exalted him to be the heavenly high priest whoever who liveth whoever liveth to make intercession for us. So we should have the spirit of Jesus instead of the spirit of the religious leaders at Jesus' birth. This leads me to the second takeaway of my sermon. Let God have the glory in whatever you do. Now, I kind of like that one because it sounds like it should be a Bible verse. And the reason it sounds like it should be a Bible verse is because it essentially is. It's a rephrasing of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. It says, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. By letting God have the glory in whatever we do, it minimizes self that so often leads to pride and could be an obstacle in putting God first. Talked about two obstacles. I have one obstacle to go. That would be relationships, specifically relationships where both parties either have differing beliefs in God or differing doctrinal beliefs. Re uh, relationships could be another area um, that makes, uh, is a hindrance to putting God first. Many examples of this in the Bible, Samson's mother and, fa and father, his parents knew the influence that for good or for bad that a relationship can have. So when Samson said, you know, I'm interested in one of those uh, daughter of the Philistines and I want to marry her, his parents asked the question, Samson, haven't you seen any one of our people that you might be interested in? Essentially, aren't you interested in a God-fearing lady instead of one of the uh, Philistines um, because they are adulterous? But Unfortunately, Samson did not listen to his parents, and he had multiple relationships with uh, uh, women that did not believe the same way he did. One of them was called Delilah. And let me just pause here for a minute. When someone shows you who they are, um, especially on multiple occasions in a negative way, um, then believe them, right? It's unlikely, perhaps, that they will change after you commit to them. Um, now you might say, Brother Fabian, in all fairness, people make mistakes, and as Christians, we should, have for, we should forgive, just like Jesus forgave us, and I agree with that. However, any objective reading of the story of Samson, will, anybody will see that Delilah did not have an, uh, Samson's best interests um, at, at her heart. When Samson pretended to tell her on multiple occasions that if you do this, this, and this, um, I will essentially uh, lose my strength. Then she did, she did the very same thing he said would have made her weak, made him weak and defenseless. She did to him on multiple occasions. I don't know how many more red flags somebody would need. And the fact is, he would not even have been in that relationship if he had listened in the beginning to his parents. So there are multiple lessons we can learn there from uh, Samson. There are examples in the New Testament as well. Even Jesus gave uh, a parable, the same Jesus that we're celebrating this Christmas season. Even he gave a parable in Luke chapter 14 of the influence of relationships. The context there, someone was creating a banquet and invited a lot of people. And he sent out his servants and say, bring the people that I've invited, everything is ready, so essentially let's start the party. Um, let's, let's, start, uh, let's put the show on the road. Unfortunately, um, one by one, individuals started making excuses. The first one said, you know what, I just bought a piece of ground, please excuse me, I can't come to the banquet. The second one says, you know what, I just bought five yoke of oxen, please excuse me, I can't make it. And I didn't realize it until I was hurt, um, uh, until just this morning. That sort of sounds like the love of money, but I already talked about that two obstacles ago. This one I want to talk about relationships. So the third person said, I have married a wife. And I want to pause there for a moment because that's the connection to this part of the sermon. He said, I have married a wife. Now, there's nothing wrong with marrying a wife. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs that whoso findeth a wife 
findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. The problem was, as the, the book Adventist Home, uh, page 351, points out, not, the problem wasn't that he had married a bride. The problem that was he married one that divorced his mind from eternal and spiritual interest. In other words, he married someone for whom God and spiritual things were not important, and because it was not important to her, eventually became not important to him. The parable was an illustration of the call of the gospel, uh, call of salvation. And he said, well, I know, God, you have called me to come to the banquet. To, you've called me to the salvation, but I want to put my spouse's interests above your interests. Again, obstacles to putting God first. The uh, relationships is another one of them. One of them. Um, <clears throat> so... Paul specifically says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, to be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, what communion hath light with darkness. So, but hold on a second, Brother Fabian. So I wasn't able to come to church today because, you know, I'm feeling under the weather with one of these variants that are going around, but I'm watching you right now online on YouTube. I have a question about what you're saying, Brother Fabian. Have you not seen or heard or read of cases where initially there was a believer and an unbeliever? Maybe they were dating or what have you. And maybe the believer said, you know, I'm not going to go um, into a commitment with you um, until you increase your spiritual level. And maybe that incentivized or influenced the unbeliever to, you know, go to Bible studies, um, and then they developed a relationship with Christ, and they converted, and the individual is married, and now that person that was formerly an unbeliever is now one of the strongest, most devoted, most active members of the church. What do you have to say about that, Brother Fabian? Well, um, I agree um, that can and has happened because with God, nothing is impossible. However, I just want to submit for consideration, every relationship is di different, but I just want to submit that perhaps that might not happen in the majority of the cases. Perhaps what might happen is that there's a believer and unbeliever, and they know where each other stand, and they say, well, we still like each other, and we know this person stands here on this, this person stands here, so we're just gonna accommodate each other and still go through with the marriage. Or what else might happen is that the unbeliever might actually come to church a few times and express interest in religious things, but as soon as a marriage is, um, happens, then they turn back to their old ways. Um, but even if the accommodation happens, there are still potentially problems. Why do you say that, Brother Fabian? Well, let's look at what happens. And, uh, let's see what the book Adventist Home says, uh, page 66. The believing one reasons that in his due relation, he, might, he must concede somewhat to con the companion of his choice. Social, worldly amusements are patronized. At first, there is great reluctance of feeling in doing this, but the interest in the truth becomes less and less, and faith is exchanged for doubt and unbelief. No one would have suspected, no one would have suspected that the once firm, conscientious believer and devoted follower of Christ could ever become the doubting, vacillating person that he now is. Oh, the change wrought by that unwise marriage. It is a dangerous thing to form a worldly alliance. Satan well knows that the hour that witnesses the marriage of many young men and women closes the history of the religious experience and usefulness. They are lost to Christ. They may for a time make an effort to live a Christian life, but all their strivings are made against a steady influence in the opposite direction. So in other words, yes, it is possible for the believer to pull up the unbeliever and that has happened, but perhaps what is more likely to happen is the believer will start accommodating um, to please the unbeliever. You know, they might say, you know what, I don't normally eat this stuff, I don't normally drink this, I don't normally go to this place, I don't normally do this, but just to please um, my partner, I will uh, do that, because maybe it's not so bad as I thought it was, and they make one compromise and another and another and another and another until they perhaps lose sight of their entire uh, belief system. Um, so as opposed, where, as opposed to the case where two individuals have the same uh, belief system, 
You know, the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. So when one of them has a bad week and questions God, the other one can encourage them with some scripture uh, text. When one of them has, you know, is feeling discouraged themselves and the other one can encourage them and they build each other up towards God and build each other up uh, towards each other as well, as opposed to the other scenario where perhaps um, there is one influence in a steady opposite direction from the other. So that's just something to consider. So what is the takeaway from this illustration? So the takeaway is to choose relationships that will help you keep God first in your life. So in particular around this part of the year, it might be the case that some individuals make uh, relationship de uh, decisions. They might want to make commitments. They might want to take their relationship to a new level, especially as it goes into the new year. They might want to say, you know what, let's start this year out on the right foot. Um, so just want to encourage uh, to make the decision to make, sorry, to make the commitment with a relationship that will help you to keep God first in your life. So. Um, I would like to recap. So again, I've talked about three obstacles. There are many I could have talked about, but we might have been here for a very long time. The first one was the long love of money. And the, I talked about Judas and Bezalel and the descendants of Bezalel and Aholiab. The takeaway there was to don't make commercialism and the love of money distract from the real goal of the season, which is to put God first. The second obstacle was pride. Um, I talked about Nebuchadnezzar as well as the re religious leaders in um, Jesus' day as well, and I contrasted it that with Jesus himself, his behavior in coming to this world, and the point there was to let God have the glory in whatever you do. And the third obstacle was relationships. I talked about Samson, and I talked about um, the parable of Luke 14 that Jesus mentioned, and the relationship, I'm sorry, the takeaway there was to choose relationships that will help you keep God first in your life. N now, oh, thank you for that. Um, um, so now it's time for my bonus slide. So what is this bonus slide? So last year, um, for a Friday night Vespers program, I did a presentation and I had a bonus slide. And the very next day, Pastor Mark had a bonus slide on his sermon, in a sermon. And for my first sermon, I had a bonus slide. But the second sermon I did, which is earlier this year, I did not have a bonus slide. And I thought, okay, well, maybe perhaps the bonus slide is dead. And many months passed. And um, what happened, an amazing thing happened, uh, Pastor Mark brought back the bonus slide, which unfortunately was the most recent sermon before his accident. And I saw he had this bonus slide, so I said, okay, well, Pastor Mark brought back the bonus slide, so let me bring it back as well, at least for this sermon. So what do you want to talk about in your bonus slide, Brother Fabian? Well, in keeping with this uh, theme of the holiday season, it might be the case that some individuals eat a little bit more than they are used to eating. It might be the case that you know they get thrown off of their exercise schedule because they're either traveling or you know, fellowshipping uh, with their family members or what have you. So I just want to talk very briefly about NEAT, uh, which is an acronym for Non-Exercise Activity Thermogenesis, which basically means the amount of calories you burn when you're not sleeping, eating, or um, exercising. So I just encourage us during this holiday season when we, the calories might creep up a little bit to just increase your need, right? So while you're spending the time with your family members and fellowshipping and sharing stories and laughing, maybe go for a walk while you're sharing those stories or maybe do some skating or do some gardening, right? Um, maybe when you go to the grocery store to, you know, return some of the gifts maybe that you don't like. Maybe park a little bit further away than you normally park and maybe take the stairs instead of the elevator. Any way to just get a little bit of more exercise um, uh, during this holiday season. And I wish uh, that everyone will have a very happy and holiday, sorry, happy and prosperous holiday season. Um, please bow your heads with me. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Um, I thank you for this message um, to not let the love of money, um, pride, and relationships, or any other thing hide our depth, um, separate us from the love of Christ. I ask you to not only help us not to hear these words, but to um, apply them in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
I'm all booked up, sorry. We don't need much. What part of I'm all booked up did you not understand? I have no room for you in my inn. Please. We've been walking for days. Do you think you are the first person to pound on my door at this hour of the night, looking for a room? There has to be something. A, a closet, perhaps. You can keep asking the same question. I'm gonna give you the same answer. Just... Why, what are you doing up? You need to rest now. We won't be any trouble. I'll pay you whatever you want. Please. I'm, I'm sorry. No vacancies. It's okay. God will provide. Hey. Give me a minute.
Wow. A blessing. Amen. Amen. I'm really impressed because uh, this church has a lot of talents. That was not like a prepared, prepared, long time preparing that program. I believe Marcel just talked to Joan about music for this week, and that's what we have. Amen. Um, thank you again for putting your talents to work. God bless you with many more. Um, we're going to close with our congregational prayer. Uh, let's all stand. Let's all say this um, prayer together. Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for you. Save me in spite of myself, my weak and Christ-like self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into pure and holy atmosphere, where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. Have a seat, please. Um, I believe there's no more announcements, but again, thank you so much. Um, I'll speak you know, from the pastors, on behalf of the pastors, church leadership. We appreciate so much the music. Um, those of you who put that together, uh, I won't mention names because I might, might miss one, but uh, again, we're grateful that uh, we have, we could celebrate the Sabbath, uh, Christmas Sabbath together with that program. Um, we can also have a potluck together, of course. I know you guys are hungry. We've kind of extended this program, but again, we're grateful. Um, happy Sabbath, everyone. I should not forget um, our prayer room here. If you have any prayer requests in your heart or you want to pray for someone, please you're welcome to pray with our elders um, and our deacons. Deacons, uh, we have prayer warriors praying all the time. Again, our church is running on prayer. So we wish you all a Merry Christmas and a blessed New Year's to come. See you next Sabbath.